Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Or good afternoon or good evening to those who are watching the service later. And happy Mother's Day to all those who are celebrating today and blessings on those for whom this is a painful day. We recognize both. Um, and uh, let's turn our attention to some announcements. Remember the mission of the month this month is Safe Place. I read some statistics which I do not remember this week about how child abuse has increased during the past year of the pandemic. Rates of reported child abuse, of course. Uh, and one of the things Safe Place does is address all forms of domestic violence, not just husband and wife, but also children. And, uh, they, and the Safe Place provides the shelter for children who are victims of abuse. And so if you wish to make an extra contribution to Safe Place, simply put an extra check in the offering plate or designate uh, what portion of your check wants to go to uh, Safe Place. Uh, on behalf of all of us here, and I know everybody who hear, is hearing my voice, I want to express our condolences and sympathy to Donnie uh, Carpenter on the death of his mother. And uh, the services will be Tuesday. Um, details, mostly all of you receive details in an email, but um, I won't turn to face Donnie because you won't be able to hear me, but I know that I speak for everybody, Donnie, when I say that we are deeply sorry and uh, uh, we certainly are praying for you and for all of the family. Also want to thank Roger Bradford. You may have noticed that as we talked about before, the steeple had to come down for the structural security of this building. I know I feel more secure knowing that it's not up there putting weight on the roof. Uh, Roger Bradford, our building coordinator, oversaw the removal of the steeple, and so I'm thankful to him. We appreciate his efforts in coordinating all of that, which was quite a logistical operation. The other thing that I need to mention is two weeks from today is Pentecost. You remember perhaps a year ago we celebrated Pentecost outside. That was our first in-person worship for however many months it had been, a couple months. And we celebrated Pentecost outside. We will do that again, this time under the pavilion. We will also have a church dinner, uh, much as we did with homecoming. It will not be potluck. Don't worry about bringing anything. Uh, we will ask for donations to cover the cost of that. I want to stress on that dinner. I'll go ahead and say, and I'll say it again next week. Um, the uh, For anybody for whom that might be a stretch, donating money for the meal, don't worry about it. We don't want any, nobody's going to, we're charging, nobody's going to be checking and what, who puts money in the donation box, and we don't want anybody to feel like you shouldn't eat because you can't afford it. Well, you can afford us a dollar or two, that's fine, or if you can't afford anything, that's fine too, don't worry about it. But for those of us who can, uh, we will be asked to donate the cost of the meal. So two weeks from today, be sure that uh, it's a good time to invite friends and family. We'll be celebrating Pentecost outside. Um, uh, we, we may have some wind, who knows? I trust we will not have fire. But uh, we, we may have some, some wind on Pentecost, we shall see. But anyway, we will be outside. Is there anything else that should be announced that I'm not aware of since our announcer in chief is not here today? All right. Then, um, the, uh, one of the Psalms could be translated Silence is praise before you, O oh God. Let's take a moment and worship God with our silence. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us worship. If you are in the sanctuary and able to stand, please stand with me for a call to worship. Sing to the Lord a new song, a song of hope and rejoicing. Praise God for wonderful acts of mercy and kindness. God has remembered God's faithful ones. God has poured blessings upon us. Praise the Lord, all the earth, shout your praise. And you may be seated, and we will continue with our congregational prayer of confession. 
which we do, uh, hopefully each of us has individually been doing self-examination and confession in the week past as part of our spiritual practices. And now as a family of faith, as a community of faith, we come together to confess our sins. So if you care to join with me as we pray together in unison saying, as the earth is being refreshed by the warmth of spring, so we have been refreshed and made new by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to stay in this euphoria forever. But you have called us to go into the valley to those who need to hear of your love and to feel your caring presence. In his words of hope, Jesus prepared his disciples to be witnesses. We have heard these words before, but far too often we have turned our backs to this message. We don't quite believe that we are capable of actually living our whole lives in your love. So we act in ways that are often neglectful and hurtful of others. We take more time pampering ourselves than we do helping other people. It is easier to justify our selfish desires than it is to witness your transforming love. Stop us in our tracks, O oh Lord. Turn us around. Help us to face our weakness and your forgiving grace. Heal us of our sins and place us again on the paths of peace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we continue with our silent and personal prayers of confession. By the authority of the one who called us to love, all of our sins, misdeeds, failures, and mistakes are forgiven. And so as we said in the call to worship, we will rejoice and worship in song. I don't know if it's a new song or not, but we will be worshiping in song.
Did you do birthdays last week, Mommy? Yes. 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 Yes.
Thank you, Jim and Mitch and Ashley and Donna, Donna Kay and uh, Donnie. We certainly appreciate uh, the music as always. On this um, sixth Sunday of Easter, let's look at our lectionary readings for the day. Psalm 98 is where we begin, which is a simple song of praise. Psalm 98 will read the entire psalm, which is short. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre. I think that's the uh, ancient version of the guitar, isn't it? Something like that, yeah. Uh, sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it the world and those who live in it, let the floods clap their hands, let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with inequity. Someone has said, if you haven't heard the rivers clapping and the mountains singing, you simply haven't been listening. And then, uh, remember, we don't do Old Testament readings during the Easter season. Acts 10 is our next uh, passage. We're coming at the conclusion of, uh, uh, you hopefully remember the story. If not, you can read all of Acts 10 and get the full story if you're leisure. Uh, Peter has been sent to a uh, Roman, Roman military officer uh, to proclaim the gospel. And so Cornelius and his family become the first non-Jews to officially receive the gospel. And we are reading the response to Peter's message to them. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers, that is to say the Jewish believers who had come with Peter, were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. That word astounded reminds us of the tremendous gap between Jews and non-Jews that existed at this time period, in which indeed, of course, often persists to the present day. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they invited him to stay for several days. And then our epistle reading continues continue with excerpts from 1 John, 1 John chapter 5, the first six verses. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, just as Cornelius and his family. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. Anyone who loves God loves those who are children of God. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world? But the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood, and the Spirit is the one that testifies for the Spirit is truth. And then our Gospel reading, we're actually picking up where we left off last week from the Last Supper Discourse, John 15, beginning with verse 9. Jesus is speaking. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love 
just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His law. I have said these things to you so that you, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. I have been privileged to hear the stories of many recovering addicts, addicts and alcoholics, and how they got into a place of recovery. And often the story I hear is a story of redemptive love. There's been somebody, or maybe more than one person, but sometimes only one person. Often it's a grandparent, by the way, a grandmother or a grandfather, who simply continued to love them. That doesn't mean indulgent love, like they gave them money for drugs, but they always knew they were loved. They always knew there was a place they could go. They knew there was somebody who would never reject them, no matter what they had done. I remember one particular addict asking him, when you were in active addiction, was there anything anybody could have said or done that would have made a difference? And he said, no, I heard it all. All you could have done was love me. All you could have done was love me. Love often makes all the difference. We call it redemptive love. Love that heal, heals us, love that frees us. Redemptive love, often it is love that makes all the difference. And so we're picking up in Jesus' words where we left off last week. Last week we talked about how to stay connected to Jesus. The NRSV calls it abiding. We talked about how to stay connected with Jesus. And today, what we're looking at is what results from being connected to Jesus. What happens when we stay connected to him in the ways we talked about last week? Well, verse 16 says that what happens is fruit that will last. I've appointed you, I've called you to produce fruit that will last. And in the context of the whole passage, the obvious answer to, well, first of all, fruit that will last. Let's think about that for a moment. Let's think of the difference between an apple and a pear. An apple will last for a long time. A pear, you know, you've got a two or three day window when that pear is edible. But an apple will last for a long time. And so Jesus is talking about fruit that lasts and he's not talking about apples and pears. What is it that lasts in the context? What is this fruit that lasts? Well, the obvious answer is love. Love is what lasts. Just as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, love never ends. He says in 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, love never ends. And so what abides, what remains, is faith, hope, and love. They continue endlessly. But the greatest of these, he says, is love. So this passage has several things to say about this lasting love. Let's look at those things. First of all, Love does. Love does. Or we could say love acts. Love does something. In verse 10, Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, that sounds a little bit like conditional love, and that can set us, uh, or disturb us a little bit. Like, uh, if you, well, if you love me, you'll do what I say. That's not what the past verse is saying, because that would be contrary to the rest of this gospel, it would be contrary to the rest of the New Testament. For example, John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world, and if we understand that, world, word, that word world, the world is that which is opposed to God. We could translate it, God so loved his enemies that he gave his only son. 
or Romans uh, 5, 8, very explicitly, Paul says, while we were still, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, that is, while we were still failures, Christ died for us. Or 1 John 4, 10, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So no, we're not talking about conditional love here. The point Jesus is making is rather that love naturally wants to please the one loved. Every lover knows that. Everybody who's ever been in love knows that. Love naturally wants to please the one who is loved. As John 14, 23 says, those who love me will keep my word. It's the natural consequence of love. If they love me, then of course they're going to do what I say. F.F. Bruce says, obedience is the natural consequence of love. Obedience is the natural consequence of love. And the reward, the disciples' reward, is the constant awareness of their master's loving approval. That's the reward I get for loving. And so what lasts is love. And love does, as Madeline Lingle says, love is not an emotion. It's a policy. We're not talking about warm fuzzies here. Now, warm fuzzies are good, but that's not what we're talking about. As Scott Peck says, love is an action. It's an activity. Love, in the New Testament sense, simply means to will and to work for another's good. It's a decision I make. It's a feeling we just, we feel. We don't choose to fall in love. Has anybody ever chosen to fall in love? It doesn't work that way. Of course not. It's not a choice we make, but agape love, the New Testament love, is a love, is a decision. I decide that I will will and act and pray for this person's good. I may not like the person. I may find it very difficult to be in the person's presence, but I can make a decision to will and to work for that person's good. Love does. Love acts. And that love, kind of love Alas. And then the second thing Jesus says in this passage is that love rejoices. In verse 11, he says, I've said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. You know, Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And the first fruit he lists is love, and the second is joy. Isn't that interesting? Joy is the second fruit of the Spirit. The church fathers, so here's some things the church fathers said, people, who, Christians who wrote in the second and third centuries, here's some of the things they said. All life has become a song. Plowing we praise, sailing we sing. Christians are children of joy. The Holy Spirit is a happy spirit. That's what they said. That was how they, that was how the Christian faith affected them. While life has become a song. That could be three-wheel drive's model, couldn't it? All life has become a song. A modern scholar has said, to turn from the classical writers to the New Testament is to turn from the cold austerity of a mountaintop to the warmth and security of home. Noticeable change in tone from the classical Greek writers to the writers of the New Testament. Henri, the late Henri now, and said, well, joy is this experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved and that nothing, sickness, failure, oppression, emotional distress, or, or even death, nothing can take that love away. As Paul puts it more poetically at the end of Romans 8, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities, neither things present nor things to come, neither height nor depth nor any power can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The assurance that we are always loved in light or in dark, in life or in death, we are loved. And that produces joy. Wendell Berry said, be joyful 
even though you have considered all the facts. Be joyful even though you have considered all the facts. And the facts aren't always very good, are they? But be joyful anyway. The love that lasts is a love of joy. A love of joy that comes from the assurance that one is forever and unconditionally loved. Love rejoices. And then thirdly, this passage says that love gives. It is the nature of love to give to the one loved. Every lover knows that. And so verse 13 says, No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And so Jesus gives an example of what it means to love. And the, the cross is the supreme example of self-giving love. But he also gives us a more day-to-day -day example in John 13, doesn't he? You remember the story, beginning of what we call the Last Supper. The disciples are gathered, and we're told Jesus loved, them, loved his disciples and loved them to the end. And so as an expression of love, he takes off his outer garment, wraps a towel around him, and begins washing the disciples' feet, something which no rabbi would ever do for his disciples, that no master would do for his servants. And he says, I've given you an example. Love one another. And this is what love looks like, washing each other's feet, doing humble service. This is what love looks like. David Brooks says, love impels people to service. Love impels people to service. Mother Teresa famously said, silence leads to prayer. Prayer leads to love. And love leads to to service. It's an inevitable progression. If we begin spending time in silence, she says, if we begin spending some time each day in silence, we'll end up helping people. We'll end up being servants to other people. As St. Corinthians 5.14 says, the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ not just motivates, but drives us to do what we do. Richard Frankel said that just as the body grows by taking in food, the soul grows by giving out. The body grows by taking in, the soul grows by giving out. And so Jesus says, "Real, this is ultimate love, laying down one's life for one's friends. Well, how in practical terms, well, probably none of us are ever going to call to be martyrs. We're not going to be called upon to do that in a literal sense. So how do we do that? What does that mean in practical terms? Well, 1 John 3, 16 through 18 says that uh, Christ laid down his life for us. And so we ought to lay down our lives for one another. And then John says, can any, how, how can anyone see their brother or sister in need and do nothing to help? The love, obviously, the love of... So laying down one's life for one's friends, John interprets as helping those who are in need. That's how we do it. Keith Miller gives another illustration in one of his books. He points out that life consists of time. Each of us has a specific amount of time. We're going to live a limited number of years, a certain number of months, a certain number of days, a certain number of minutes. We don't have an infinite supply. And so Keith Miller says, whenever we are really listening to someone, totally focused on what that person is saying, totally concentrating on that person, we are at that moment laying down our life for that person. Because we're sacrificing 20 minutes or however long the conversation is, we're sacrificing a piece of our life to listen to that person. And he calls that laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So, whether it be a listening ear, a helping hand, or an open wallet, we are laying down a portion of our lives for one another. When we listen, when we help, when we give, we are laying down a portion of our lives for our friends. And that, John and Keith Miller says, is following the example of our Lord. 
That is a love that lasts, a love that gives and gives and gives. And then lastly, love shares. In verse 15, Jesus says, I don't call you servants any longer. I call you friends. Because a servant doesn't know what the master is doing, but I've told you everything I've heard from my father. Everything. I've held nothing back. I told it all to you, and so you are my friends. The love that lasts leads to intimacy. Friendship implies intimacy. The love that lasts leads to fellowship. The love that lasts leads to the sharing of our lives with one another. Some of you have heard this story before, and some of you have forgotten it, but it's worth saying again. And some of you haven't heard it before. A rabbi uh, and one of his disciples. So the disciple was one day very verbosely uh, expressing his love for the rabbi. Oh, rabbi, I just love you so much. And finally the rabbi got irritated and he said, do you know what causes me pain? And the disciple had to admit, well, no, I don't. And the rabbi said, how can you say you love me when you've never bothered to find out what causes me pain? It's one, say, one thing to say, I love somebody, I, I, we love one another. But do we know it love enough to find out what causes one another pain? Love, well, C.S. Lewis said that the romantic love is two people gazing at one another. Friendship and love, he said, is two people standing side by side, gazing at a common interest. And for the Christian, that common interest is Christ. He is a common interest. He is what binds us together spiritual formation, serving him and serving him by serving others. A love that lasts is a love that shares, a love that cares enough to find out what causes one another pain. A love that lasts is a love that shares openly and honestly. And the Mott, and the Mott says, how can love possibly be enough this time, this new tragedy, this new loss, this new evil. Can love possibly be enough? And she answers her own question, yes, it will. Love will always be enough. As she puts it, love bats last. Love bats last. Love will always be enough. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. According to legend, the aged John the Apostle lived in Ephesus in his lived to a very old age and became, became very frail, so frail that he could not walk. And so every Lord's Day, he was carried into worship. And every Lord's Day, the pastor respectfully asked John, John, do you have anything to say to the congregation? And every Lord's Day, John would say, Little children, love one another. And one day the pastor, in some exasperation, said, John, you say that every week. Do you have anything else to say? And John said, it is the Lord's command. It is enough. It is enough. Little children, love one another. It is the Lord's command. It is enough. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me if you're here in the sanctuary? As we join together to remind ourselves of what we believe and to bear witness to what we believe, reciting for, I wonder how many times in this spot of ground the Apostles' Creed has been recited. I have no idea. But we're going to do it again. So join with me if you care to as we recite together this ancient creed saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead and descended into heaven. 
There he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll turn our attention to our prayer concerns. We want, of course, to pray for all mothers today and for all those who are hurting because it is Mother's Day. Those who have lost their mothers, those who have never been mothers and what wanted to be, mothers who have lost children. There are many forms of, uh, of grief today. We want to pray for all mothers. And, of course, we always pray for our North Alabama Presbytery and for our session. We continue praying for the COVID uh, pandemic, especially remembering the suffering people of India. And also remember, Vina asked us to pray for Tracy, who has COVID. And we continue praying about the opioid and suicide epidemic and the healing of hate, anger, prejudice, and violence. Cancer patients, Sadie, Jennifer, Doug, Wayne, Beverly, Dolores, Whitney, John, Corey, uh, uh, Mark, um, Bill, and Jim. And of course, we want to remember other prayer requests, the Carpenter family, Donnie, and all of his family and their grief. We pray for Franklin, for Murphy, for Alex, for Paulette, for Valerie, and for Mark, and for Charlie, who is supposed to come home from rehab tomorrow. And so we want special prayers for him and for Donna and Tom and managing his care. Let's take a few moments for silent prayer so that each of us can pray about those things that we don't want to mention and so that we can pray about whomever, whatever personal needs we may have. And I will lead us in prayer and we conclude our prayer time by praying together the Lord's Prayer. We use the debts and debtors version as we pray. Let's bow for a few moments of silent prayer. Our Father, we marvel at your love for us despite our many failures, despite our often not believing in that love, and yet you love us still, and for that we thank you. We thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you for your love for each of us. We thank you for the lo your love for everyone hearing the sound of my voice. And we thank you for your love for all of those for whom we have prayed. And we ask, perhaps we can ask nothing more than that every person for whom we have prayed would feel some sense of your love, would feel the embrace of your unconditional love and your unrelenting grace. We ask that for all those whom we have named, those we have named aloud and those we have named silently. And we ask that for each of us here, whether we are here physically or whether we are here electronically. May in the week ahead, all of us feel the embrace of your love. May we move through the week in the awareness that we are loved, that no matter what happens, we are loved, and we are called to love and to be loving towards all those who cross our paths. So grant us the grace of love, the grace to love, even as you have given us the gift of love. And so we entrust all those for whom we care and pray, and we entrust all of ourselves to your love. As we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with our worship now by receiving our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
Donna Kay is going to play a brief piano interlude while we make decisions. How will we respond to this passage? What will we do about its call to love? Maybe it's a private decision. Maybe it's a public decision. Maybe some of us need to decide to accept Jesus as Lord for the first time, or we need to decide to become a member, an official member of this church family. If it's a public decision, well, Donna Kay plays, you're welcome to come to the front, and I will join you there. But I'm going to be quiet for a moment while Donna Kay plays, and we make our own decisions about how we respond to this text. Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may we live so loved and loving that our lives will bring glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God reigning forever and ever. Amen. Children go with us in the old, how we must in the old, I'm going to sing the ten by ten, ten was the ten commandments, nine was the nine who stood in the line, eight was the eight the way to the gate, seven was the seven who never got to heaven, six was the six who didn't get fixed, five was the five who came back to life, four was the four who stood at the door, three was the Hebrew children, two was the four. 